I will tell you one of the byproducts of fasting. Is a sensitivity to what is of God. particular song I think has a meaning and a connection maybe in a different way for each and every one of us that particular song was one of my grandmother's favorites it's one that my mother adopted as one of her favorites And it speaks a message to us today about how we should live our lives. Of course, one day at a time. The next, the tomorrow may not be ours. But it's what we do and who we serve in the time that we're given. Where is our attention? What are the words and the deeds that we perform in a day? Who do they honor? Can't help but to think of that verse about do not lay your treasures, do not store your treasures up here on earth. They're so limited. They're so fragile. But the things that are important, we lay up in heaven where the moth and rust can't destroy. In this season that we're going through corporately and individually as a body of believers, fasting, setting ourselves aside for God and His use in this upcoming year. Or however many days in this year God allows us to be part of His creation. There's a realization that you come to that each of us in our own different way have a barrier between us and what it is that God desires of us. And I believe fasting is the quickest, the best, the most assured way of finding what that barrier is. We are not going to be in the book of Acts today. We are going to be in the book of Isaiah in chapter 58. And while we're turning there, I'm going to give a little bit of background there in this book of Isaiah. 
astonishing, uh, it is astonishing to me that Isaiah consists of 66 chapters. The same amount of books that we have in the Bible. And more astonishing than that is that the first 39 chapters, which is how many books we have in the Old Testament, deal with the sin that's running rampant throughout God's chosen people. And because sin is running rampant in God's chosen people, the whole earth is overrun with sin. Because we, if you remember, God established His people. He redeemed them out of Egypt and Egypt's bondage and slavery to set them apart as His own to be a beacon unto the rest of the nations to draw them into the one true God, Yahweh. But they've settled in. They've forgotten their first love. They have lived for flesh and self instead of God. But as we talk about so many times in here, there's always hope. So this time, this first 39 books in Isaiah are dealing with the judgment that is to come upon them because of their sin. The hope is that the last 27 chapters, which is the exact amount of books that we have in the New Testament, deal with the coming, the prophetic verse of a coming Messiah, a salvation through Him. So ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to look at today is probably, well not probably, it is the most, I guess the most numerous amount of verses dedicated in you know, consecutive order to fasting. We see it throughout the Bible, throughout Scripture, there are 77 times where Scripture alludes to fasting throughout the Old and New Testament. Seventy-seven times. I don't know if you realize this or not, but fasting is alluded to more times than water baptism. Yet look at the church today. How many sermons throughout your life have you heard on fasting? Probably far less than any other subject, if at all. It, was, it wasn't until me and my wife came here under Brother Will that I heard a sermon on fasting, that I participated in fasting. So it is something that we desperately need because even though it is not mandatory for us under the new covenant to fast, Jesus himself said when he, talk, when he was talking to his disciples, when you fast, not if you fast, or if you determine to, choose to, whatever. He says when you fast. So uh, even though it's not mandated, it is assumed that believers in Christ Jesus will take part in this. And that's where we are today, and we'll get into this further. Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for provoking my spirit this morning. I thank you that your mighty hand works through many vessels. And Lord, that choices of songs to bring before your throne today may have had a meaning for the individuals who performed them this morning, who lifted their voices unto you in your honor this morning. 
had no realization the impact they would have on others. Lord, I thank you for the gifts you bestowed upon those that led us in worship today. And Lord, I thank you for their zeal in performing that duty. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would reside within us this morning, that he would speak in lieu of this flesh, and that we would receive power and anointing in your name. That's my plea. And I ask it in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. So we have this judgment that we're talking about in the first 39 verses, or 39 chapters rather, of Isaiah. And they're not just to Judah and Israel. At this point in time, the, the nation has split into two. Under different rulers, different kings, all of that. But the sin is not, doesn't just lie with them. In those chapters, God utilizes Isaiah as his mouthpiece to proclaim judgment upon many nations. Judah, Israel... Assyria, Babylon, Moab, Syria, Egypt, Ethiopia. There were no nations that did not come under condemnation in those first 39 chapters. But the beauty of it is the ability for redemption also comes to all those nations. In those last 27 chapters we spoke about, that Messiah, that Jesus Christ that was to come to shed His blood for the atonement of everyone's sins who calls upon His name as Lord and Savior. Every individual within each of those nations and even today has that opportunity. Well, we have a tendency to settle into repetition, I guess would be the word for it. Tradition. These ordinances that man has established that we just fall into lockstep and just assume. And unfortunately, when generation after generation after generation assumes man's ordinances, it becomes like a mock theology. These are things that we're supposed to do. And these younger generations assume that when the fact of the matter is they have nothing to do with honoring God. And I believe that's where we're at in the church in America today. We have made a bit of a, not a bit of mockery, we made a full mockery of what it means to be Christians today. One of the things that we fail to acknowledge is the masterful job that Satan has done. in the venue of pride. I told y'all that I would share a little bit of a story here. This well, uh, we got a call from Chris, our neighbor next door, uh, or I say uh, reached out to Brandy, and, uh, and she let, or he through her, let everybody know that, hey, we've got a, we've got a bust of break in the well. So get up here, uh, and sure enough, we have a, a line on the outside of the well house that um, had a fracture in it, cut the water off. Um, and said, okay, I'm going to start digging this out. You know, or actually, I'm sorry, I came up the next day to start repairing it and was going to 
just cut out the section that was bad and install you know, a, cup, a couple of couplers and a piece of pipe, no problem. Go to cut the pipe, the whole thing snaps off at the ground. <laughs> you know, one of the other byproducts of fasting is that you don't have the strength to really get too bent out of shape. You're just like, ugh, you know. Well, then I was like, okay, well, I'll just dig this up, and we'll just have to make the connections uh, a little more detailed, a little further down in the ground, start digging them up. Well, lo and behold, there's a wire two inches below the surface of the dirt that I cut clean through. And, uh, and so, anyway, it just became one thing. You've all heard of the Midas touch. When you touch everything, there's gold, turns to gold. Well, I don't know what you call the opposite of that, but... Huh? Murphy's, Murphy's Law. There you go. There you go. Well, let me tell you what. It was raining down the last couple of days as it pertains to that well. Everything that I touched broke a little further back. We had issues here, issues there. Needless to say... Uh, well, we'll just bring that up in a business meeting coming, <laughs> coming up soon. Well, I had one thing that you know, I said something about it being that black pipe. I do have a couple of small pieces there. <laughs> well, we, it, the materials are here. It's just, uh, it became uh, uh, a, bit of a bit of a challenge now. And, you know, in the midst of this, you just, you know, like I said, you realize that there is no room for pride in our service, in our allegiance to Christ. Yet it's prevalent. And we don't realize it because of its acceptance or its variations in acceptance in our society. When we have something that goes wrong, the first thing we want to take off the list is serving God. Stop and think about it. Myself, first and foremost. Something goes wrong. I don't have time to pray. I need to do this. Or I don't have time to read my Bible or spend time in God's Word. I don't have time for that. I've got to do this. We make everything of more importance or more import than God. And you really see that come to the surface, come to the forefront in the midst of a fast. Because you realize that your strength is not your own. You realize that you're Everything that God designed in this body has been corrupted by the way that we eat and we pattern our lives. And we see the evidence of it growing day by day. I don't know if y'all have spent much time thinking about this. The occurrences of cancers of various sorts seems to be growing by leaps and bounds. And it's because we have gotten outside of the ordinances established by God as it pertains to food. I've got a dear friend, Chris Young, that we've, we're working on some scheduling and stuff like that, but he, is, he has gone into great detail of studying this uh, particular subject, and he's going to come, uh, as soon as we get the schedules worked out, uh, to be able to present his findings about how we nourish or think we're nourishing ourselves, how we eat and our lifestyles we live, and uh, he'll get into that in greater detail. But here we're going to see Isaiah talking to Judah and Israel in chapter 58 and how they have placed traditions or man's disciplines in place of honoring and serving God. 
And starting in verse 1 here, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. But God is telling Isaiah right now, hey, speak on my behalf and let these people know, all of them, that their transgressions and their sins are prevalent. I see them. They are profound. They have changed the direction of the course of this nation that, that God had established. And now they've turned it on its ear. And this is, these next verses are sort of tongue-in-cheek. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. And you look at that and you're like, well, man, they're spot on. But this is sarcastic. This is, this is, this may be the way you were at one time, but your actions and your deeds do not model your original heart. And we'll see that in verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say? And have you not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? What, he say, what they're say, God is saying here through Isaiah is that the people are taking part in fasts and they're, they're approaching the Lord and they're wanting to hear from the Lord But their lives outside of this fast do not model what their expectations are during their time of fasting. So now they're asking, well, why, why is God not seeing what we're doing? Is God deaf? Is He not paying attention to us? One of the things that we need to, we need to understand in this situation is that God does turn a deaf ear to those who do not acknowledge Him, who do not designate their lives to honoring Him. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear. If I have sin in my life and I know that it's there and I choose not to do anything about it, how can I serve God under those circumstances? It's one thing to not know what you're doing is sin. But when somebody tells you or God's Word or His Holy Spirit provokes you to, and, and calls it out for what it is and you still choose not to do anything about it, man, you've placed yourself on an island. And that's what God's people had done at this point in time. To finish out uh, verse 3, In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. So what he's saying is, right then and there, even in the midst of a fast, you find a way to serve yourself. One of the things that we take for granted in this nation is if we say we're going to participate in a Daniel fast, we don't have to work now to be able to determine what crops we will grow or what we will, we will do what, that we could reap a harvest to sustain us through a Daniel fast. We just jump in our vehicle, drive to the nearest grocery store, bam, 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 there it all is. But one of the things that you will find real fast if you walk through a grocery store aisle by aisle, do this the next time you're in there, how many of those foods that are in there are grown and raised 
and harvested as opposed to manufactured. When I was a young and growing up, we would go to the Piggly Wiggly over on, I think that's 85th Street and, and uh, Linwood. There wasn't aisle after aisle after aisle after aisle after aisle of stuff with seven to eight different varieties of each of those stuffs in an aisle. You know, it was very simple. And most of the time, and as I was growing up, it was bologna or potted meat, you know. Neither of which are foods, just to let y'all know. But when you're, when you're dirt poor, uh, that's, that's sort of what you have to, you have to lean on. Uh, however, you go down those aisles and there are entire aisles that are devoted to food-like substances. Case in point, if people were to abide, if Christians were to abide by God's word and follow his ordinances, how many fast food joints do you think would close down? But we have done the same thing. We have gone the way of the world just like, just like Israel has in Isaiah's day. We have gone the way of the world. We are supporting those things while killing ourselves. Again, me first and foremost of all. And then we want to pray to God, oh bless us. While I'm tearing down this temple in which your Holy Spirit resides, this is me talking to the other three in my head, guys, so y'all just, just listen in. As you're tearing down your temple in which the Holy Spirit resides, you're asking God for His blessing upon your life. And then when things come about because we were smoking or drinking or or you know, eating or living frivolously and all that, and, and those chickens come home to roost, so to speak, then we're like, how does this happen? Oh, my Lord. Consequences. Consequences. Isaiah is trying to tell Israel and Judah at this point in time, guys, God is not listening to you due to the consequences of your own actions. Verse 4, Indeed you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this, this day, to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? Man, can you imagine God saying those words? And He is. God said, I didn't choose for you to go on a fast and then you to act in such a belligerent way against your brothers and sisters. You're going to find pleasure when you should be humbling yourself and bringing yourself low. You're going to exploit your laborers. You're going to fast and call upon a fast, but yet everything that you need done, you're going to do to those who work for you. You're going to have them do it in your stead. They should be fasting with you. you as the light of the world that they were to be at that point in time, they should be ministering to those who serve them. Yet they isolated themselves. Verse 5, again, it says, God asks, is this the fast that I have chosen? A day for a man... To afflict his soul. What we need to understand, there was only, in the Old Testament, there was only one mandated day for Israel to fast. And that was on the Day of Atonement. Any other time that they uh, individually or corporately fasted, it was because they were in need of something from God. Deliverance of, you know, invading armies or pestilence or famine or whatever the case may be. So, if you're doing this 
and you're really not taking it to heart, you're just doing it because it's a tradition, do you really expect God to hear it? Do you, do you expect God to acknowledge it? And that's what we see taking place here. Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day of the Lord? Man, they, they are getting rebuked by God right now. And you know the Holy Spirit has to be upon Isaiah at this point in time. Otherwise, he would be worried about getting ripped limb from limb, making this proclamation. But look at this in verse 6. Is this not the fast I have chosen? And look at this, guys. This is what God desires from us. To loose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring your house the, uh, into your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. Do you see this turn of events? When God says, this is the fast that I desire of my people, it doesn't say anything about designating a day to go without. He's requiring our obedience, first and foremost. That is why it is not mandated under the new covenant to fast. But Jesus, being fully God and fully man at the same time, he knew that we would fall into sin. He knew we would fall into transgressions. So he said, when you fast. Here we see this breakdown of the things that we desire as humans. We, whether you're in Christ or not, you don't want to see wickedness prevail. You don't want to be under the pressure of heavy burdens. You don't want to see people oppressed. You want to see freedom for all. And you want every yoke of bondage removed from those suffering from it. That's the same desire God has. And once we determine that this, our desires and God's desires are one and the same, then it should change our actions and our activities to do what we see between seven uh, and verse seven there. You see somebody that's hungry? Help them. Feed them. Give them a meal. And this one's one, again, I'm going to say this. We're going to have this conversation behind the pulpit. If y'all take anything from it, good. If not, bringing, opening your home to those less fortunate to you. Wow. Wow. That's why I say pride, ladies and gentlemen, is the biggest, biggest stumbling block that we have in serving God.
When you see the naked, you cover them. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. What that means there, it doesn't have anything to do with self. We, when we see somebody in need, when we see somebody in distress, you know, we do the whole, I'm just going to drive right past this person looking the other way. That flesh that it's talking about is your brother or your sister in need. When we get those things right, when we're obedient to those things, we are, in a sense, of no need to fast because we are in full submission and obedience to God. But look at the benefits to those who do fall under that obedience. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your light. You ever been driving down an old country road and all of a sudden somebody comes around the corner and they've got their high beams on? And it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. When's the last time that we have impacted somebody else's life in such a way that they were just like, Whoo. hold on just a second. That Shekinah glory is so bright upon us from being in the presence of God that people see it, acknowledge it. We, as believers in Christ, have the same mandate upon us that God's chosen people in the Old Testament have. We are to be a light of the world, a light to the world just like they were. And we have fallen short corporately as the church in America today. So we see there that our light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. You hear that? Healing. Isn't that the first thing when, we're, when we go to the doctor and we get those results of whatever that test or scan or whatnot may be and it's not good? The first thing we do is we come home and we pray, Lord, heal me, restore me. And you know God's desire is to do that very thing just like we see here in these verses. His desire is to do nothing but that. But because of His holiness, His righteousness, and our fallen state, there's a barrier between us. We may know Christ as Lord and Savior. Our salvation may be assured to us or is assured to us. However, there are some consequences we're going to have to face and endure because there's a, there's a blockage there. Just like that water will not, right, right now, not make it through all the lines to get inside this building to serve its purpose. Sin in our lives will disrupt that ability for that flow back and forth between us and the one we serve. And your righteousness shall go before you. Wow. When people, when people think about you, oh, they're, they're handsome, they're pretty, they're this, they're that, they're smart, you know, they, they, could, they speak well, all these different kinds of things. But do they, any, does anybody come and say, that's a righteous individual. And not talking about like the 80s righteous, you know. I'm talking about biblical righteousness. Does anybody list that as your, some of your attributes, or mine for that matter? Probably not.
The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Man, I'm going to tell you that part I love. I love. I don't have to look back. I'm doing His duty. I can go forward full steam ahead because I know that what I'm doing is His calling and I don't have to worry about what's behind me. I know y'all have heard this before, but when we talk about the, 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 the whole armor of God, guess what? It doesn't speak about anything on the backside. Your bum can be exposed because you've got everything you need to move forward. God will have your back. And he goes even further when he reiterates this in verse 9. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Guys, I don't know where you are in your walk with Christ today. But I can tell you, if you don't get excited and desire this aspect of God and His nature and His attributes, then uh, you, may, you may want to check your salvation. That, to me, is a promise that I want to hold on to. I want to do what, it's what is necessary in my life to know that when my prayers go before God, that He hears them. That when I step out in faith to honor Him in whatever I do and whatever I say, that I don't have to worry about who's got my back. And he goes back again. So these are, we have the if you do, then I will do. Then it goes back to if you do, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking weakness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. Here he goes again. He reiter reiterates, this is what I desire for you to do. Put this into action into your lives if you say that you are mine and I am your God. And then it picks back up again. Then, oh, I'm sorry. Extend the soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul. Then your light shall dawn in the darkness again. And your darkness shall be as noonday. There is no darkness. When everything's exposed, everything's out in the open, there's nothing to hide. Everything's wide open. You are in God's glory, in His will. The Lord will guide you. How often does it say right there? Continually. Not when you decide to get right with God. Not when you decide to repent of sinful activity in your life. When you have submitted to Him in this form of obedience, His guidance is continual. And satisfy your soul in drought. Even during the dark times, even during the, the times of calamity around you or issues that you may not have foreseen. Brittle pipes and wires in the ground and stuff that you want to spit and kick the dirt and even when those things take place you will be satisfied and strengthen your bones you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of waters a uh, spring of water whose waters do not fail you know, guys, I, I wax and wane about the, 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 the gifts of the Holy Spirit and those manifesting themselves, you know, and I lean on the side that, uh, that they are continual to this day. I'm not a, I think they call a cessationist, where those are uh, been terminated uh, after the apostles. 
But one of the reasons that those gifts of the Holy Spirit do not manifest themselves in the way that we see in the New Testament is because of how far we've gotten away from God. Oh yeah, we go to church every Sunday, we go to church every Wednesday, blah, 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 all the things. You know, I give to however many of those ladies there are that uh, come panhandling multiple times a year. Those aren't the things that honor God. It's what do you do Monday morning and the rest of the days of the week? Who are you devoting yourself to? Look at this in verse 12. These are the blessings that are upon you that we, we read up to this point. Then verse 12 says, Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in. Isaiah is prophesying right here about the destruction of Jerusalem. He is saying that when you abide in me, then there will be people to stand in the gap at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. And people will look to those people who are standing in the gap in God's name and say, if it wasn't for you and who you serve, where would we be? I know you right now, there are people in your family that at least at some point in time have said that about you in your service to God. What you were able to do when you stepped into a situation and it was resolved, or you stepped in in a time of need and gave, or you just spent time praying with someone, visiting with someone. People look at you and still look at you with admiration because you did what God prompted you to do. Same thing happens here. And it goes on uh, to close this out in sort of the same fashion. What is honorable to God and what is honorable in just man's eyes. But as I was... I'm, actually, before I even got to these verses or this chapter 58 in Isaiah, in some of my quiet times, some of the old verses over the years had come back. And that's what God promises, that when He says, don't worry about what you will say when you're before the judges, that, that He's got that taken care of. He does that to remind us from time to time. Because who, in all honesty, we are our worst judges in most cases. One of the things that associates uh, with these same verses of another prophet, Zechariah, in chapter 7, verses 5 through 6, it says, Say to all the people of the land and the priest, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years which they were in captivity, was it for me you fasted? This is God speaking through Zechariah. And when you eat and when you drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Stop and think about that. Chew on that. The things that we partake of to sustain us, are they honoring God or are they just to satisfy the flesh? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I'm a steak and potatoes guy. The sweets, you can have them. And doing that from time to time is probably not a bad thing, but when you think that, well, I work 
outside and I was sweating this, that, and the other, and you know, and I'm a man, you know, all that kind of nonsense that we come up with in our prideful selves. And you're like, I do this so many days a week, I deserve a steak at least once a week. Well, guess what else you deserve? A heart attack. And I probably had that coming too. So. But isn't it like us? God says, I have given you the bounty of the earth. And we really do. Like I said, there's none of us here that can't go to a grocery store right now in a vehicle that we pay fuel and insurance and taxes and all those kind of things to go to a grocery store to pluck from a shelf the things that are of God. The fruit of His vine. But are we doing it in honor of Him? Paul in Romans 14, 5 through 8 says, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all, esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since she gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives unto himself, and none of us dies unto himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. There's no gap in there. There's no time out. There's no pause. There's no space for self in the midst of that. We either choose to serve the Lord or we choose not to. We either designate a day or we designate every day. One of the things that uh, I guess I want to close in here two verses that have that I'm sort of leaning on during this season, this fast that we're in. And just to let y'all know, y'all realize we're one-third of the way through that fast. Just saying. Psalms 46.10, y'all probably know this by heart. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalt exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. There's two things we can see there. One, His command, be still and know that He is God. He is commanding us as followers of Him to do just that. Stop. Step out of that hamster wheel of life and say, Lord, I need Your clarity. I need Your wisdom. I need Your guidance. And I'm not getting it in the midst of this chaos. So he's asking us to do that. And then he says, He will be exalted in all the nations and all the earth. And one of the things that we can take from that is that it's going to happen do you want to be a part of it? It's going to happen with or without you. Do you want to be a part of it? And the last verse that we'll close with is Joshua 24, 15. And if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And Joshua says before God's people, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Today, ladies and gentlemen, during this, this day, this day that we, in a season, a season of fasting that we are going through, who are you serving? Who is your God? As you measure 
the amount of time devoted to your flesh, devoted to your pride, devoted to the things that you feel are important as opposed to the time that you devote to God, what would those scales say as to whom you serve? That's the question before us to stay. As we close this season of that first portion of our fast, which was consecrating ourselves, taking this time set aside to have God show us where our sins, where our shortcomings lie. In this next season, we're going to basically be asking, Lord, what is it that you would have of me? If I've got this other stuff laid out, if I've repented of these sins, if I have uh, changed my ways and areas of my life, Lord, now that I've purified myself before you, what would you have of me now? That's the season we go into this next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you humbled. We come before you contrite of spirit. And Lord, we know that that is exactly what you desire. And that is exactly why these seasons of fasting are established. <clears throat> and Lord, even though it is not mandatory for us to do that, Lord, we do it willingly, Lord. And I pray that as we continue this pattern in our individual lives lived for you and corporately as the body of Christ here at North Keithville Baptist Church, Lord, that you would keep us focused on the purpose. That it wouldn't be just something that would become ritual. That each and every time we would be laid low before you. And we would surrender ourselves afresh to you in these seasons. And Lord, we fully expect these promises that you've declared in Isaiah 58. Those principles Lord, we know that you are faithful. We know that you will provide. We know that you will sustain in the good times and the bad. And Lord, we thank you that we can be assured of these promises when we align ourselves with your will. Let that be the cry of our heart today, Lord, and during this season, Lord, that we would say, more of you, less of me. Lord, there are many in this congregation today that are here and weren't able to make it here today, Lord, that are going through struggles, that are going through issues. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon them in this season. That you would strengthen them. That you would give them courage and boldness. And most importantly, Lord, that you would give them peace. Lord, I pray that around each and every one of those individuals. Lord, I pray that around each and every one of us as a whole. 
And Lord, in the days ahead, may we align ourselves with you in such a way that we know in full confidence that it will come to pass. Lord, if there is someone here today that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray that your Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, would convict them. To take care of that business today. To walk out of these doors today into this world knowing that their salvation, their eternity is assured. A simple prayer. Nothing more, nothing less. Lord, for those here that may have stumbled in their walk, We know that you love a repenting heart, Lord. A contrite spirit. May they utilize this time to set that right with you. And that they can hold their chin up high as they walk out these doors into this world. Knowing that that past, those circumstances, that sin is under the blood and it's forgiven. And they are your redeemed children. This is our prayer today, Lord. Let us make most, the most of the time that we are given. One day at a time. In Christ's name I pray, amen.